Go ahead and open your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Micah. Or if you prefer the Hebrew pronunciation, Mika. You gotta do that kind of throat phlegm thing, Mika. We've been studying through the minor prophets, taking a, a big picture look at some of the least read and least studied and least preached books in the Bible. I previously used the analogy of these books being a little bit like Nebraska or Iowa. They're the, the flyover states that we pass through on our way to somewhere else. And we, we read them because they're in the Bible and we're supposed to. But in reality, there's a lot more to these short poetic works than we give them credit for. And all the poetry and imagery that's hard to understand, and all the specific references to specific people groups, it can be hard for us to see the big picture or the, the transcendent truth that these books present. And so we're making our way through them, highlighting those details, so that as we read them and study them for ourselves, we can not only appreciate the minor prophets more, but we can be transformed as the Holy Spirit moves us to apply the message. Remember, the minor prophets are only minor in that they wrote less than the other prophets. Their message still carries major weight. They were originally compiled on one scroll called the Book of the Twelve. Each book reads like a chapter in a larger work. So right after Jonah, the prophet of mercy, who was angry with God for showing mercy to Nineveh, we read in Micah that God will hold the Hebrew people accountable for withholding mercy themselves. But God, who keeps his promises, still offers hope. They, they will face deserved judgment for their sin, but clearly and boldly, Micah presents hope in the coming Messiah. Now, because of some of the spiritual abuses that are done in the name of things like prophecy, it's worth reminding everyone again that the prophets are not fortune tellers. Biblical prophets do give details about future things, but only as those things are revealed to them by God. They actually have more to say about the past behavior of the people than they do about future things, and the future things they describe come in the form of legal pronouncements. Because the people have behaved a certain way, they violated their covenant with God, God will do what the covenant says. He'll do exactly what He told them, and the, the prophets announced that in advance. I like the analogy of them working like lawyers, that God commissions to bring formal charges against people for their sin. So people violate the covenant agreement they made with God. God brings the charges through the prophet and announces ahead of time what he'll do in response to human behavior. That courtroom analogy, that courtroom imagery is really, really clear in Micah. In Micah 1, verse 2, it says, Hear all you people, listen, O earth, and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. So from the temple, God through Micah is testifying. He's holding court and he's testifying against people. And like we saw in Obadiah, what Micah says to Israel, God says to all the earth. There's more courtroom imagery in chapter 6. In chapter 6, he, he, he calls on the people to bring their accusations or to, to bring their defense of themselves before God. And if they have charges, they should bring them. He says that the mountains and the earth itself will stand as the judge in this court between God and the people of Israel. Micah 6.3, God challenges Israel to cross-examine him. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Testify against me. So we see this courtroom drama taking place. Micah is the attorney bringing charges on God's behalf. So who is this covenant lawyer commissioned by God? Who is it that's bringing these charges? And what are their crimes? What does Micah prophetically say God will do in response? We're going to follow the template that we've used for all of the minor prophets thus far. We'll survey the book for answers to those four questions. 
Who is the author? Who's the audience? What's the problem? What are the promises? And along the way, we'll make specific application to our lives because as we see, even though this is addressed to specific people, there's timeless truths that are meant to be understood by all. So Micah was a prophet from a small town called Morasheth. This little village was fairly rural, about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem. Verse 1 of chapter 1 tells us when Micah ministered as a prophet, and therefore when he lived. It says he served during the reign of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. These are all kings of Judah. This, this means that Micah lived during the time when Israel in the north and Judah in the south were divided. They were functioning as separate kingdoms. Jotham began to rule in the south in 750 B.C. Hezekiah died in 687 B.C. That gives us a possible span of about 63 years that Micah served as a prophet. His career began again while Jotham was king in the south. 2 Chronicles 27, 2-6 describes Jotham this way. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. According to all that his father Uzziah had done, although he did not enter the temple of the Lord, but still the people acted corruptly. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord, and he built extensively on the walls of Othel. Moreover, he built cities in the mountains of Judah, and in the forests he built fortresses and towers. He also fought with the king of the Ammonites and defeated them. And the people of Ammon gave him in that year 100 talents of silver, 10,000 cores of wheat and 10,000 of barley. The people of Ammon paid this to him in the same king, Jotham. That's in the south. So while Jotham is building up Judah, ensuring that God was being honored in the temple, the people are still corrupt, but at least they're being led by somebody who isn't. In the north, they have, well, let's say Jotham's evil counterpart, Pekah. He's described this way. 2 Kings 15, 28-30. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel sin. In the days of King Pekah, of, in the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came and took Eom, Abel, Beth, Makkah, Genoa, Kadesh, Hazor, Gilead, Galilee, and all the land of Naphtali. And he carried them captive to Assyria. So Pekah, good king or bad king? Bad king. Made the people sin. Con getting conquered. Should I switch mics? We're just going to use this one. So that's at the beginning of Micah's ministry. The Hebrew people were divided. Judah in the south. Israel in the north, Judah had a good king in Jotham, Israel had a wicked king in Pekah. Pekah was taking losses at the hands of the Assyrians. Then Jotham, the good king in the south, died. And Micah witnesses Ahaz become king in the south, in Judah. Ahaz, to put it lightly, wasn't quite the king that Jotham was. Apparently, Pekah thought Ahaz was weak, and so at Pekah's command, the northern kingdom attacked the southern kingdom. At that time, God sent the prophet Isaiah to encourage Ahaz not to fear. God specifically told Ahaz to trust in him, that he would protect Judah. But Ahaz refused to listen. Instead of trusting God... Ahaz looked to the nation that had been eating Pekah's lunch for help. Who was that? Assyria. Ahaz stole gold that had been dedicated to the worship of God in the temple. He plundered the temple to pay off the king of Assyria and hire him as muscle to keep him safe from his Hebrew brothers in the north. Just so we're keeping track of that, God sent the prophet Isaiah to tell him, you'll be safe, I'll protect you. He said, no, no, I don't want that protection. Stole gold from the temple and paid Assyria for the protection that God promised. 
It gets worse. Ahaz becomes so fond of the Assyrians and all their ways that he introduced child sacrifices, the same ones that the Assyrians practiced. He built a replica of the altar that they used for pagan worship. He desecrated the temple in Jerusalem, stripping it of the building materials that he needed to make more of those replica pagan altars anywhere he could build them. In 2 Chronicles 28, 24 through 25, it says this, So Ahaz gathered articles of the house of God, cut in pieces the articles of the house of God, shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, and made for himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem, and in every single city of Judah he made high places to burn incense to other gods, and provoked to anger the Lord God of his fathers. All right, so we're keeping track. Ahaz, good king or bad king? Super bad king. Micah witnesses Judah being led into the same corruption and sin that characterized the kingdom in the north and that characterized his evil neighbors. He witnesses Judah becoming just like the people that God drove out of the land in the first place. The wickedness spread to the northern kingdom first and then into the south. Micah writes in, in chapter 1, verse 9, Her wounds are incurable, for it has come to Judah. It has come to the gate of my people, to Jerusalem. So Micah is the author. We know when he lived. We know what's going on in the nation. He's from Judah, but he brings legal charges against Israel in the north and Judah in the south. There's divided nations in conflict with each other, but Micah calls them both out for the sin they held in common. They were divided nations united in sin. Now, this may be a side note, but we see clearly that Micah's allegiance to God is greater than his allegiance to his homeland or its human leaders. For Micah, following the Lord is greater it's of greater importance than going along with the party agenda. He's able to identify the sin and corruption on both sides of the aisle. Micah calls out Israel in the north, and then he names city after city in the south, including his own hometown of Morishet. The point that I'm trying to make here is that our allegiance to Christ should never take a back seat to our political or professional or ethnic affiliations. Our allegiance to Christ should never take a back seat to our political, professional, or ethnic affiliations. We can't let ourselves be blind to the sin and idolatry that exists in our own camp any more than we can give excuses for the sin and idolatry on the other side. Perhaps you felt like this before. I mean, as we come into another election cycle, I find myself wishing I could vote for Jesus. I feel like a, like a political orphan sometimes. I look at one side of the aisle, and they advocate for things that are horrific and indefensible, and they turn a blind eye to the blatant corruption staring them in the face. And then I look at the other side, and they seem completely unwilling to look at any of the actual issues going on in this country, and, and instead they give all their attention to their own personal grievances. Their complete focus is on getting even. And the reality is, is that either of those descriptions, they're completely interchangeable, depending on which side of the aisle you're on. You could describe the other side either way. You could describe your own party either way. But nobody wants to be an orphan. Everybody wants a tribe. And so we give in to the temptation to overlook idolatry and corruption in whatever group we find more tolerable. But we're not orphans. Micah isn't alone, and neither are we. He speaks on behalf of of a remnant of people whose allegiance to God makes them feel like they're not at home anywhere. He speaks on behalf of that remnant trusting in the Lord in chapter 7. He writes, Woe is me, for I am like those who gather summer fruits, 
Like those who glean vintage grapes, there is no cluster to eat of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires. The faithful man has perished from the earth, and there, was, there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. Micah and this remnant of faithful people are willing to endure that feeling of being political orphans because they know they aren't. They know who they belong to, and they aren't willing to compromise and turn a blind eye to idolatry and corruption to fit in. They're not willing to compromise. They know that God is still on the throne and that He hasn't abandoned them. He says in chapter 7, verse 7, Therefore I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. My friends, look to the Lord and keep your eyes there. He is our one King and He's worthy of all of our allegiance. Is that difficult in the world we live in? Absolutely. It can feel very lonely, especially if we don't take advantage of the opportunities that we have for biblical fellowship. But Micah is willing. He says as much. He acknowledges that that's a difficult position and that that would take strength from God to be willing to stand in that narrow way and stand for truth regardless if he gets exiled from both camps. He says in chapter 3, verse 8, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sin. Oh, that God would give us that same power and might to stand for truth in a corrupt age, even if it means we stand alone. So Micah witnesses the growing sinfulness of his own people under Ahaz. He's aware of the wickedness of the northern kingdom as well, and he brings charges against both kingdoms because his primary allegiance is to God. What are those charges? What problem is God through Micah addressing? Well, for that, I'll turn to one of my, one of my handy-dandy charts. Micah's poetry, again, written over the course of his long career, is compiled and organized in a way where he proclaims sin and judgment and then hope. If you're looking down the left-hand side, sin, judgment, and hope. Now, that's not hope in hope. That's hope in the Messiah. Micah has some remarkably specific things to say about the Messiah, and he says them 700 years in advance. This pattern of sin and judgment and messianic hope is repeated three times in seven chapters. Now remember, this is my chart. This isn't Micah's chart. That chart's not the inspired word of God. What Micah wrote is... This chart just helps my feeble mind to understand the big picture that Mike is communicating, and I, I hope it helps you too. The, the charges against both kingdoms are woven throughout the whole book, but they can be summarized this way. In addition to idol worship and pagan rituals that we already read about, Micah says that the Hebrew people had perverted justice, withheld mercy, and done it all in arrogant defiance of God. And, and don't worry if you didn't get to read the rest of the chart, because we'll come back to it. That's the, 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 that's, that's the problem. That's the charges that he brings up. They've perverted justice without mercy and done it all in arrogant defiance of God. So how did they pervert justice? Remember, remember in the law that God built a system of justice that included mercy he built it into the law that was supposed to govern Israel. One of the things that we read about in Leviticus is that if a man fell on hard times, he could temporarily sell some of his land to pay his debts. Now, that was more like a long-term lease. And whoever held that lease could work the land and keep the income that the land produced. But each plot of land remained the property of the family God originally gave it to Whenever that family was able, whenever they were able, 
The law guaranteed they could buy the land back at a reasonable price, even if the leaseholder didn't want to part with it. And after 50 years, even if they couldn't pay it off, it was given back to them. Justice balanced with mercy. But in Micah 2, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we read that those in positions of power dreamed up schemes to cheat men out of that land inheritance. It says this, Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. At morning light they practice it because it's in the power of their hand. Why do they do this? Because they can. Because they have the power to get away with it. They covet fields and take them by violence. Also houses and seize them so they oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Micah uses some very graphic imagery to describe how those in positions of power and influence treated the common folk. It says in Micah 3, 1 through 3, Hear now, O heads of Jacob, and you rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? In other words, they should know what justice looks like. You who hate good and love evil, who strip the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin from them, break their bones, and chop them in pieces like meat for the pot, like flesh in the cauldron. I mean, I don't know that I've ever read any anything more merciless. I don't know that I can imagine a more merciless description of how people could be treated anywhere. They're chopped up, their skin is peeled off of them, they're like flesh in a cauldron. He says that to Israel's leaders, that that's how they're oppressing the poor. They're perverting justice. They're withholding mercy. Then in chapter 3, verse 5, Micah puts the prophets in the crosshairs. He speaks of those who are supposed to be ministers of God's word. He says this, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who make my people stray, who chant peace while they chew with their teeth, but prepare war against him who puts nothing in their mouths. So these so-called ministers would offer some feel-good word of blessing, even if it wasn't grounded in truth, to whoever would pay them, whoever would feed them. But then if you didn't pay them or feed them, if you didn't give them what they wanted, or you refused to pay for their ear tickling, they would come and, uh, come and attack you. I mean, imagine you come to church, and I stand up here and I go, okay, so, so you know, you guys bring in a lot of tithe money that I could put in my pockets, and then I'll bless you. If you don't, I'm punching you all in the face. That's what's going on. And we could go on and on. We see references to participation in pagan sex cults. We see corrupt business practices, unbalanced scales. In chapter 3, there's a really neatly packed summary of the sin that characterized the covenant people of God. Again, this is Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Micah 3, 9 through 11. Now hear this. You heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of Israel who abhor justice and pervert all equity, who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity, her heads judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No harm can come to us. We see that pattern, that that pattern of sin, perverting justice, withholding mercy, arrogant defiance. We have the temple. The temple's here. Nothing bad could ever happen. We could do whatever we want, and because the temple's here, God will never hold us accountable. Absolute arrogant defiance. Again, as we read in ch chapter 1, Whatever Micah says to the Hebrew people, God says to all of us. And so as much as we might wish it weren't true, 
The people that Micah describes aren't all that different from our culture. We live in a culture full of sexually deviant behavior. We idolize money and power. And the ruling class is full of corruption. In our country, we oppress the poorest among us by giving them just enough free stuff to keep them satiated and happy so that they can continue to empower the corrupt politicians with the way they vote. But perhaps what troubles me the most is Micah's description of the religious leaders and how it's so remarkably similar to what we see among the religious leaders in our culture, in our day. So-called ministers who won't simply open the Word of God and preach what it says in context. Instead, they twist and manipulate God's Word to offer people whatever people will pay them for in the currency of their choosing. Perhaps it's the prosperity preachers shilling empty promises to those who will sow a double seed into their ministry. Perhaps it's those who compromise God's standards and explain away, you know, the parts of the Bible that don't fit cultural values? You just explain those away. Let's talk around them. What our culture calls sin, God, what, what, our, what our culture, what, excuse me, what God calls sin, our culture calls non-traditional but equally valid life choices. And, 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 and preachers all throughout the United States of America find a way to twist and manipulate God's Word to validate those things that God calls sin. Perhaps it's the ministers who grossly sensationalize certain theological concepts and overemphasize them to appeal to the carnally minded. Every word, every message is about the rapture or manifestation of gifts or some vision or special, special revelation known only to them. And they, they do it all in exchange for money or power or the personal satisfaction of having the title pastor. Either way, their primary interest is in satisfying themselves rather than faithfully proclaiming the word of the Lord. And people eat it up. But the same arrogance as the political leaders and prophets in Micah's day, they do it with this arrogance, thinking they won't be held accountable. Notice, notice how they say, no harm can come upon us. But let's not mistake this. Micah is pointed and specific in what he promises. Again, hope has the final word. But, but judgment from God is certain. As we look at this pattern on my chart again, we see the what and the why of the judgment that God promises. And it's more than fire and smoke. This is not just wrath and brimstone. It's corrective discipline. Don't get me wrong, it's not a slap on the wrist. It's severe. But it's corrective, which is why the hope comes with it. Look how fitting the judgment is, considering the crime. They were cheating people out of their land inheritance, and then God speaks of a judgment day to come in Micah 2, 4 through 5. In that day, one shall take up a proverb against you and lament with a bitter lamentation, saying, We are utterly destroyed. He has changed the heritage of my people. How he has removed it from me. To a turncoat, he has divided our fields. Therefore, you will have no one to determine the boundaries by lot in the assembly of the Lord. What did they take? What did they cheat people out of? Their land inheritance. What's taken from them? Their land inheritance. They're going to be conquered by a people worse than them. Specifically, Assyria and Babylon. The land made them arrogant. Losing it will humble them. And when the land's conquered, the cities will be destroyed. And look what Micah says will happen to their idols at the destruction of their cities. Micah 1, verse 7. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces, and all her pay 
as a harlot shall be burned with the fire. All her idols I will lay desolate, for she gathered it from the pay of a harlot, and they shall return to the pay of a harlot. To the leaders who withheld mercy in their violent oppression and extortion of the poor, God through Micah says everything will be taken. To the lying prophets and the people who flock to them, God says he'll be absolutely silent and speak to them no more. To the corrupt priests who are only interested in the paycheck, he says the temple where they minister will be torn down. All of this will happen in the conquering invasions by Assyria and Babylon. You guys see how the punishment fits the crime? How it's corrective. It's, it's not overly punitive. It's, not, it's severe, but it's not overly heavy-handed. He, if the problem is idols, he brings upon them that which crushes their idols. If the problem is arrogance, he brings upon them that which will humble them. And it's exactly what God promised them when he brought them into the land in the first place. Again, Micah is a covenant attorney. They have a covenant agreement with God. They all agreed to this. Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 18. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. And that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. In other words, if you obey, if you honor the Lord and the land, you get to keep it and He'll bless you there. Verse 17, but if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. Did God make this clear in advance? Did He tell them exactly what would happen? You're going into the land. Honor me, you keep it. Dishonor me, you're going to get treated the same way as I treated the people that I already drove out. Each judgment is fitting with the crime. The judgment of God is fair and corrective and never without mercy. They've done what God warned them not to do, and so God, being the God of justice that He is, brings upon them the exact judgment that He told them He would bring. They're conquered. They forfeit the land because they didn't honor God in the land. But as promised, hope has the final word. If we can look at that chart one more time. You see that each section ends with a promise that either has been or will be fulfilled in the Messiah. In being conquered, they became slaves of Babylon. But spiritually, they were already slaves to sin. They were physically taken captive, but they, like us, apart from Christ, were spiritually chained to sin and depravity. But we read in Micah chapter 2 of one who comes to free us. Micah 2, 12 through 13. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like the sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of their pasture. They shall make a loud noise because of so many people. The one who breaks open will come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. Take a closer look at what we just read. They were conquered. And after they were conquered, God says he's going to gather them and set them free, and a shepherd king would lead them. They won't stay in Babylon forever, but that's only half the story. They'll be led by a shepherd king out of their slavery to sin. And then in Micah 5, 2, it tells us exactly where that shepherd king will come from. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, 
though you were little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. He goes on to say that in that shepherd king born in Bethlehem that he would rule and bring peace upon the earth. Again, that's written 700 years before the birth of Christ. And that's why we sing a Christmas song in September. In chapter 4, it says that the shepherd king born in Bethlehem will one day rule from a newly built and better Jerusalem. A Jerusalem that's high above the hills. I don't know how that works. I don't know if Micah knew how that would work. But he says that there's this Jerusalem that's ascended above the mountains. And from there, the shepherd king born in Bethlehem will rule and reign and people from many nations will come to that king and learn his word and walk in his ways. That's us. That's the church. As I've said many times, there's a now and not yet aspect to the kingdom of God. God did bring a remnant home to Jerusalem. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. One day, He will return. He'll conquer every enemy, and He'll rule and reign as King of all kings. And when He does, the peace that we have in Christ right now will be the peace that governs the whole world. Amen? That's our hope. That's what we hope in. That's what should get us out of bed and motivate us every day. If we don't have that hope, then, then well, there is none. This is the hope that we have in Christ. It's the hope that we know. But the people first hearing Micah seem to have missed the hope in his message. They hear him about judgment, but they miss that promise of peace. They don't want God's wrath, and so they respond. They want to know what they should do in light of the fact that they're guilty before God. Isn't that a common thing? What should we do to appease God? What works can we do to get back in His good graces? We know we're messed up. We know we're guilty. What can we do? What religious duty can we perform to impress Him and earn His love? It's exactly what they ask. Micah 6, 6 and 7. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings? With calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with ten thousand of rams, ten th with a thousand of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? The fact that they ask that question indicates that they miss that whole message of hope in Micah's message, in Micah's preaching. How do we know they miss it? Of, of course, of course, God doesn't want them to sacrifice their firstborn to atone for their sin. He, he already promised to sacrifice His own Son. They miss it. All this promise about the Messiah, they miss it and they go, you, you, you want me to sacrifice my children? That's what the Assyrians do. That's how they appease their God, should I sacrifice my children? And God's already promised to sacrifice His own Son for their sin. Peace with God won't come by any sacrifice we can make. It's God who pays the price for our redemption. It's God who pays the price that brings us peace. And God had already revealed that to these people through a prophet who served and preached at the same time as Micah. In fact, Micah and Isaiah might have been friends. He said through Isaiah to these people, Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, speaking of the Messiah that they miss, surely he has borne our griefs 
He carried away our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So God wasn't interested in their vain religious exercise. He didn't want 10,000 rivers of oil. I don't know how you'd even do that. 1,000 rams, he wasn't interested. He wanted their hearts. He wanted genuine repentance and faith in the living God who promised to redeem them by the work of Jesus Christ who was and is and is to come. He wanted them to trust in Him to transform them. So Micah responds. He responds to these people saying, well, what works can we do? How do we get back in God's good graces? What if we sacrifice all this stuff? What if we sacrifice our children? He says, no, not outward works, but things that come from new hearts as people who trust in the promised Messiah. Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? We can only do justly if we've been justified. Right? We're, we're lawbreakers. What, what Micah says to the Hebrew people, God says to the whole world. We're lawbreakers. We can't do justly until we're no longer guilty enemies of God as lawbreakers. We can only love mercy when we understand our great need for God's mercy. And we walk humbly with God by submitting to His authority over our lives. To do what Micah commands, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God is to trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sin. The book ends with one more really clear picture of Messianic hope. Yes, the people are guilty. Idolatry and corruption were rampant. Assyria was at the door. They're ready to conquer the northern kingdom. Babylon wasn't far behind them. He's, he's ready to finish them off in the south. But the shepherd king who was promised to come from Bethlehem would lead a remnant of his people home. The shepherd king who will one day rule from a new Jerusalem will conquer every form of opposition to his kingdom and establish peace on earth forever. But he promises to do one more thing. Micah 7, 18, 18 through 20. And, and read this out loud with me, everybody together. Slowly and all together. Ready? Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. My friends, the hope that we have in the Messiah, the shepherd king of Bethlehem, is that our sin is thrown into the depths of the sea. What Micah says to Israel, God says to us all, the hope that we have in the Messiah is that all of our sin, all of our idolatry, all of our corruption, all of it's thrown into the depths of the sea. And one day, our king will bring us home. So as a point of application this morning, 
look to Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Listen, any, any honest reflection of our lives will show us areas where, where we, like the Hebrew people that Micah describes, are guilty. We know that God is a just God, and therefore the penalty of our sin must be paid. It's not unlike the court of law today. Each violation of the law demands a certain payment, be it a fine or a sentence. The same is true in God's courtroom, but the standards are much higher. Our sin, our lies, our idolatry, they're capital offenses. The Bible says the soul that sins must die. So there's no amount of sacrifice or religious exercise that we can perform to atone for our sin. Micah made that really clear. But God in His great love, not wanting us to perish, gave His one and only Son to die in our place. And by His perfect life and sacrificial death, Jesus paid what we owe. And so there's hope. And it's a hope that will never fail us. But it's only found, it's only found in Christ. So today, right here and now, turn from your sin and trust in Christ. Look to Christ alone for the, for the forgiveness of sin. And from there, understand that looking to Him and trusting in Him for the forgiveness of sin means following Him and living for Him. It's a fantastic exchange. You can't, you'll never be offered a better deal than this in your life if you had a thousand lifetimes. He dies in your place and you get to live in His place. And Micah summarizes what this living for Him looks like. What does the Lord require? That you do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. So, ask yourself a few questions. Do you do what is honest and upright and full of integrity? Or do you cheat and lie? and cut corners because you have the power to get away with it. Do you love mercy? I mean, you love mercy for you, but do you love mercy enough to demonstrate it to the undeserving? Are you merciful with others? How about when they act unjustly? about when they don't value what you value, when they are corrupt? How about when they're just hungry and thirsty? Do you love mercy enough to extend mercy and compassion and grace to others? Are you walking humbly? Are you walking submitted to God and His Word, submitting to His authority, even, even when His Word doesn't fit the cultural agenda? Do you let Him direct your steps and lead you? Do you surrender your plans and purposes to God and adopt His plans and purposes for you because He's King over you? You'll never regret that, I promise. You want to know why? He's really, really good at being God. He's king. He's great at it. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your word this morning. Let it not fall on deaf ears. 
or hard hearts. God, would you search us, point out things in us. If right now we're thinking of all the people that, oh, they should have been there, they really needed to hear that message, Lord, we have, we have erred. You're speaking to us, to the corruption and idolatry and sin that we, we need you to purge from our hearts and from our minds and from our lives. Lord, would you help us to be people of integrity, to do justly? Would you help us to love mercy? You've shown mercy to us. You cast our sin into the depths of the sea. There's no greater act of mercy than we can imagine. Help us to be people of mercy. Lord, in that there should be a humility that acknowledges that you're the king on the throne. You've not abandoned us. You've not left us. And we don't need to arrogantly stand with or posture ourselves behind any other throne. Because one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so God, help us to do that every day in worship and adoration and praise of who you are willingly. That we not be forced to bow in the day of judgment where you explode our shin bones and force us to our knees. Thank you for the price you paid for our redemption, Jesus. You are king over me. God's people said, Amen. Amen.